Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome one and all. My name is Sophia Greskin and I direct the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health at the University of Southern California. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to this panel discussion on how a One Health approach can help us to understand and address health inequalities and drawing on some really exciting work in Uganda and at the global level. Uh, traditionally, I think we all know this, but the health of humans, of animals, and of the planet were largely addressed separately in training and in research, but also in terms of policy and action. People were trained in only one of these areas, which of course led to work being carried out more in silos, even if in some ways all of the work is actually connected in the effort to improve health. Uh, more recently, the need for interconnectedness in addressing these areas has not only become better understood, but in a lot of places actually prioritized. And at this point, many understand that a One Health perspective really does provide a framework to address human, animal, and environmental health synergistically, but it also highlights the need for interdisciplinarity in a real way in how it is that we think to approach these issues. There's the rhetoric of interdisciplinarity and then there's the reality. And the challenges of actually doing interdisciplinary work are evident in all it is that, that we do. We've got to do a more systematic job in bridging our respective disciplines and bringing together basic scientists, social scientists, modelers, regulators, and, and people from communities amongst many, many others. And from a governance and government perspective, it means bringing together very different sectors, including health, finance, and wildlife, but honestly, you name it, you know, each of which has worked individually for decades. But One Health really offers an opportunity to collaborate, to share know-how and policy priorities, and, and equally as important, infrastructure, and of course, resources. Now, this is a focus for us at IIGH in that the complexity of One Health raises really important questions for those of us who are concerned with health inequalities, both in terms of how to identify which populations are most disadvantaged or risk becoming most disadvantaged over time, and critically to understand and therefore address the factors that drive these inequalities, including larger structural factors like the legal and policy environment. So following the maxim of the sustainable development goals as we strive to leave no one behind, we can't do this unless we really get to the root of these challenges. And so with that, this panel really is exciting in that it brings together representatives of the UN, of national government, of civil society, all working in the field of One Health, each one bringing a different institutional and disciplinary perspective to the discussion, and importantly to our efforts here, each one also bringing a shared concern around how best to address the inequalities that surface in the context of One Health. I, I genuinely truly want to thank the, our speakers for joining us today to being in this dialogue with us on these critical issues and really, really look forward to the discussion. And with that, I want to warmly turn it over to our amazing moderator for today's event, Dr. Laura Ferguson. As our Institute's Director of Research, Laura manages a broad portfolio of research on inequalities in global health. But importantly here, this includes a One Health project in Uganda led by one of our, one of our panelists, Dr. Luana, that we'll be hearing about for which Laura leads the legal and policy aspect of this work. I am super excited about this as I keep saying. Laura, please, over to you. Thank, thank you so much, Sophia. Um, and uh, I'd like to add my welcome, first of all, to the panelists, of course, to, to all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have so, so many of you here with us today for this discussion. Um, so as, as, as everybody knows, climate change, which many of us consider uh, an existential threat and COVID, the most severe pandemic in a very long time, have really brought, brought to the fore how interconnected we as humans are with our planet and its other inhabitants. And as Sophia has mentioned, One Health provides a way for us to think synergistically about the health of humans, animals, and the planet. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. You know, we're seeing humans encroaching on the environment and on animals' habitats, exacerbating the risk of spillover disease as well as environmental catastrophes. Um, and One Health is really designed to be an integrated, unifying approach to balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and the environment. Um, so, it definitely mobilizes multiple sectors, different disciplines and communities at varying levels of society 
to work together to address these root causes of ill health and inequalities and create long-term sustainable solutions. Um, and we've tried to mobilize a panel along those same lines, representing different disciplines and different sectors and with a view to thinking about solutions. Um, so I'll introduce panelists in a second, um, but before I do that, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Sophia had said about um, the work of the Institute on Inequalities in Global Health. Um, our work focuses on understanding and addressing inequalities. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time in areas such as HIV, sexual and reproductive health. We apply often a human rights lens and, and generate evidence around laws, policies and structures and how they might be strengthened to improve or address inequalities. Um, and when we bring that into the One Health sphere, which is a newer area for us, it raises all sorts of new complexities. And that's what we're really grappling with right now, is how do we take the learnings that we have from addressing inequalities in other areas of health into One Health? And so for today's panel, I've asked our speakers to help us think about this and how One Health can be used as a framework for understanding and addressing inequalities. Um, each speaker brings a wealth of experience. Um, so I'll introduce each of them briefly and then ask them to speak for around 10 minutes before we get to some Q&A. Uh, so please put your questions in the Q&A function at, at any point throughout the webinar and, and I'll get to as many as I can uh, once we've given the panelists a chance to, to speak. So, our first speaker is Dr. Doug Webb. Um, he is the United Nations Development Program's resident representative for Georgia, living in Tbilisi. Um, up till just about two weeks ago, I think, he was UNDP's global health and environment advisor based in Jordan. Um, so he's just undergone a big move, but trained as a social epidemiologist, Dr. Webb's work um, in his recent position, uh, focused on the health and environment nexus, looking at infectious and chronic epidemic response governance and the social determinants of health in the context of environmental change. He's held several leadership positions across different UN agencies in responses to COVID, Ebola and HIV, to name just a few. Uh, and he's also an adjunct professor at the School of Global Public Health at New York University. Um, so with that, I will open up and uh, pass it over to Doug uh, for his initial remarks. So thank you. Over to you, Doug. Thank you, Laura. Goodness me. Um, uh, let me. So if you could put the slides up, can you see them? Yes, we see them. OK, I can't see them. All right, I can see them now. Right. I hope you can still see them. Yes. Um, right. Great. Yeah. So I'm I'm transitioning from um, somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about these things and advising on them. And I've been working on HIV for a long time, and then working on uh, chronic diseases, and then um, COVID and uh, Zika before that, and Ebola. I was in the in the uh, emergency response in West Africa, and more recently the, uh, the Ugandan outbreak and and Marburg and all sorts of things. So. This is a composite of different thoughts over over time. So, um, and then more recently with other UN agencies and putting together this Nature for Health Fund, which is a One Health Fund um, with uh, UNEP and WHO um, and some NGOs as well about environmental aspects. So I'm, I'm putting together some thoughts really from the global level, but based on a lot of country experience and, and designs, trying to think through what we, um, some of the sort of framings so if you go to the next slide and um, and just to think about, well, you know, what are we talking about in terms of the, the objectivization or the objective elements of, of One Health? There's different sort of starting points. And very often, the, you know, the epidemiologists would come in with the sort of the, the proximal determinants or the, the, the objectification. And they'll sort of say, well, here's the map of bushmeat activity. And this is the starting point for a lot of agencies trying to find a handle on on the risk profile or, um, you know, the, the zoonotic spillover, um, in a sense, behavioral profile. And bushmeat activity is, is one of the entry points. And 
But even then, if you're looking at push me trade or behavioral patterns in itself, it has its own political economy and social economy and, and behavioral economy and so on. So even then, the objectification of, of behaviors and uh, specific activities has their own sort of complexities within them. And then if you go to the, the next slide, and then you look at these composite maps of, of, of EIDs or emerging infectious disease risks, you end up in Africa with the same geography, more or less. Um, but And it doesn't really help. The point is these objective sort of mappings don't really help us um, in terms of what are we going to do? Um, and we're, we're left still with these sort of fuzzy maps and lots of dots. Um, so this it inevitably comes down to sort of a governance question for me and a question of, well, what is the, in a sense, the social economy or the political economy? Um, and I think that's where we start. And that's where I wanted to come back to. So even if the question's about inequality, um, there are, for me, very much competing ideas, competing or contested frames here. And, and if you go to the next slide, I just want to sort of rush through um, what is not absolutely a list of any authority whatsoever. It's something I, I sort of whipped off in a sense, but it's to give you some sense of where the concept of inequality can be applied or where differentiation can be applied and how different actors are looking at this um, and how One Health is being discussed or situated or conceptualized or um, negotiated perhaps in different venues, processes, um, fora, and so on. And, and it's worth just sort of stepping back and acknowledging that there are, you know, the meta-narratives at the moment around climate change, uh, particularly health security, uh, where this is absolutely situated, health securitization um, of the One Health debate, which is essentially a protectionist agenda of the, of the global north. Um, looking at how to stop essentially nasty pathogens from the global south causing a nuisance um, to the high-income countries of the north. I mean, COVID has, has turned that on its head to some extent, but that's that's still a very strong philosophy. Planetary health is, 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 is around, um, but doesn't, in my mind, have an awful lot of utility in, um, in practical terms. It, it's 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 got currency, but it's it's not that useful um, for me. Sorry, that's not a UNDP because we do use it, but but it, it doesn't help. SDGs are still there, of course, um, but again, um, we're now starting to actually focus in on which SDGs are most useful uh, and start looking at um, accelerators and co-benefits within them. So even SDGs have a, a reduced political currency. Post-COVID visioning, of course, we were talking about resets and we were talking about reconstruction and, and building back better and so on. And a lot of that optimism, I think, has been just simply vaporized, even if the um, economic indicators are quite are quite positive in many in many contexts. But pandemic prevention, prevention and response is, is probably where One Health has its, uh, has its meta home, I think, particularly with the with the framework legislation conversations around um, the treaty and um, the um, revision of the um, international health regulations. And that's where probably the disappointment uh, is probably most acute regarding um, where One Health has a home in terms of global political processes. But then going beyond that into the sort of nuts and bolts, um, you then have these subcategories, I would call them sort of perhaps thematic or proximal categories of, well, what are we talking about? We're talking about deforestation, um, be it legal or illegal. Illegal is particularly important. Um, in my mind, because that's where you find people running in and out under the cover of darkness or just unaccounted for uh, in illegal or, or marginal economies. And that's where you find a lot of actual spillover events taking place. Um, conservation has its own legal framework uh, and protection uh, around it. Land use change, of course, particularly uh, around monocropping, which is and, and, and um, movement to particularly um, a pastoral use. Wildlife trade, um, not legal and illegal, um, is a lot of uh, areas of interest uh, and grazing linked to that, particularly cattle. And then you'd have more distal, uh, again, back to climate uh, and microclimate changes. Water has got a lot more political attention. 
disease evolution surveillance frameworks, uh, heat, heat stress, heat impact on particularly vectors and their behaviors, with a lot of interest in malarial movements, for example. Um, pollution has got a certain amount and its links with anti, uh, antimicrobial resistance. And then there's another sort of a whole area of interest around livelihoods in these zoonotic uh, areas. So there's there's different sort of thematic needs. Just this is, this list isn't exhaustive by any any means. Um, there's institutional processes, institutions and processes. The, there's the UN arrangements, the quadripartite led by WHO and FAO. Um, there's the UN framework convention on climate change, which doesn't really have much room for One Health, but it says it should. The national adaptation plans, loss and damage is where the money could come in if they, we could start demonstrating links, nationally determined contributions, health sector plans, health security plans, disaster risk reduction. So there's all the sort of sort of operationalization and there's always this nodding to One Health. But if you look for it, it's very difficult to find. Um, the tools, um, again, again what, what do we have at our disposal? There's legal scans, environmental assessments, there's um, economic frameworks or investment cases, you know, the costs of inaction, the cost, the, the cost benefit analysis of action, and they're very underdeveloped in this, in this area um, of zoonotic uh, prevention. Um, there's various meta-analyses that have been done, but they're not very, uh, they're not applied at local levels at all. Um, subsidy and fiscal policy reform, commercial determinant analysis. Uh, this is most applicable probably in the mining sector or some of the agro industries who are fiercely resistant, generally speaking, to legislative reform to improve uh, commercial practices um, uh, or logging, for example, or any form of conservation. Um, then you've got geographies. Uh, you know, you've got the small island developing states. Uh, and so you've got these urban, rural uh, attentions, and then you've got the, the principles and enablers, leaving on behind, inequity, last mile, integration, co-benefits. So there's a, there's a massive amount of ways to, to, to dice up uh, the issue. And inequities is just one of them. But each of these could talk to each other, is the point. We go on to the, the next, um, the next uh, slide. I just wanted to just talk about... Some of the the problems we've got with this also this idea of localization um, within the One Health world because a lot of the real work goes on at a community level and there's a a general problem I think with um, the way that communities are engaged in this um, because generally communities and context has been seen to be a fairly large I think problem in this area most of the um, the, the design. Is, is, is largely not empathetic towards uh, local opinion, uh, local institutions, community behaviors or responses. They seem to be problematized in the response, um, uh, overruled particularly. Um, the context is seen to be faulty or dysfunctional. Equilibrium should be restored, uh, restored by overruling uh, whatever the, the, the context has been which led to the overspill uh, event in the first place. So rejection of the context and 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 problematization problematization of the context is is where things have started. So operationalizational plans, policies are generally created outside. So if you want to go in and mobilize support and and planning and preemptive, um, in a sense, risk mapping with communities is very difficult. Um, and it actually goes against. Uh, the grain. And the last thing I'll, I'll say on this is that very often the high risk zones, of course, are uh, characterized by populations who are themselves probably uh, of low political capital. They are marginalized, they're geographically marginalized, socially marginalized, uh, operating or living in areas where um, they are far from the center. They have uh, probably in areas where the, 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 there are corporations who probably have much higher economic and political capital. Um, the state is weak. Um, so the local governance structures uh, are not in the favor of a, a community engagement in terms of risk mapping or access to economic and political capital. So you very often find that if you've got communities at risk, engaging in, in very often illegal activities or on the margins of the of the of the formal economy 
you can guarantee that they are not going to be in a position to assert rights or demand services or be part of a formalized information network. Um, and, and they're likely to be not only at epidemiological risk, um, but they are under the radar economically and socially and probably going to be in some form of intersectional group um, of vulnerability and, and possibly hopping borders and in a transboundary manner. Um, so to look at the zoonotic spill and the One Health um, sort of paradigm, to do it properly, you've got to be working uh, in these contexts where community engagement is, is actually complicated, far more complicated um, than working in many other health risk environments. So I wanted just to, to paint that picture very quickly that the narratives are confused. Um, I don't think there's a dominant paradigm here for One Health at all. I think it is contested. It's very highly politicized. And then when you're talking about the risk environments in which One Health is operating or wants to operate, um, the, the, the normal rules of health risk engagement as we would understand them, or mitigation or planning, um, are, are complicated, particularly by the socio-political environments in which we find ourselves. Um, and that is about as brief as I can be without um, going into much more detail. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. Um, and that was um, a really excellent sort of high level overview. I really appreciate um, you bringing that, that perspective. And I think that the note where you ended on the importance and challenges of community engagement provide a, a perfect segue to our, our second speaker, um, who is Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka. Um, and just as a brief introduction, Gladys received her bachelor, bachelor in veterinary medicine from the Royal Veterinary College at the University of London, after which she established the Uganda Wildlife Authority's first veterinary department. Um, and then a bit later in 2003, she founded Conservation Through Public Health, which is an award-winning NGO and nonprofit that protects endangered gorillas and other wildlife through One Health approaches. And to this day, she, she remains CEO of the organization. In 2015, she founded Gorilla Conservation Coffee to support farmers living around habitats where gorillas are found. She became a National Geographic Explorer in 2018, and she recently has written a memoir about her conservation and leadership journey shaped by One Health, which I recommend very highly indeed. It's an excellent read. Um, so bringing us the, the perspective from her work and experience, um, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Gladys, welcome. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, let me get ready to do the presentation. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me. This is really an interesting and important topic. I'm actually speaking to you right now from Windy, Impenetrable National Park, home to half of the world's, estimated half of the world's mountain gorillas. And the One Health lessons I'm going to talk about are connected because they're connected basically between people and wildlife, and in particular, gorillas. And that's why the photograph on the front basically shows a community health worker giving a presentation to her community, changing their behavior in the context of guerrilla conservation. And I'm excited to be on the WHO Scientific Advisory Group for the Origin of Novel Pathogens and to have won awards for our One Health approach to conservation. It's really great that I was in University of Southern California last week, I think, <laughs> giving a talk uh, about our work. And it's so great to be here now virtually from Uganda. Uh, when I received this award from UNEP because of our One Health approach. When we first started working and implementing this approach 20 years ago, many people wondered where we're combining conservation and public health. And I'm really glad that UNEP is now seeing One Health as a way of promoting, you know, as a sustainable approach to conservation and sustainable development. But of course, one thing that I really emphasized and which they picked up is that you really need local champions to be the people, to be empowered to do this work because they're gonna be the decision makers for their communities and countries right up to the level of parliament because many of them eventually get to parliament. And if there are people who believe in One Health and conservation, then the future is brighter for everyone. 
The mountain gorillas are found in two distinct populations, and the main one that we're working with is the second discovered population in Buhoma, where I'm speaking from now. I actually just got back from the gorillas. And they are only about just over 1,000 left in the world, but their numbers have steadily grown. But because they're so closely related to us, we can easily make them sick, and they can easily make us sick. And the biggest threats to the subspecies are habitat loss. And habitat loss is very much due to the very high human population growth rates, where all gorilla subspecies are found in Africa, apart from Gabon maybe, but everywhere else, there's very high population densities. And particularly in Bwindi, it's about 300 people per square kilometer. So you find a very hard edge between the community and the park. This particular gorilla got scabies from the local community because they got it when they ranged into people's gardens to eat their banana plants. And people put out dirty clothing on scarecrows to chase away gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife. And poaching is an issue mainly for other, other animals in the forest, which people can get diseases from, such as the dica, the bush pig. And some people have even started eating monkeys, unfortunately, but it's not all that common. But if the gorillas cross over to countries like DRC, they can also get eaten, and the chimpanzees as well. And all of this uh, leads to potential for cross-species disease transmission, but they do get caught in snares and spears set for other animals. Sometimes we don't know whether they have what whether what they have is related to humans or not, such as this rectal prolapse, which could have happened because of picking up human parasites and straining to defecate. So we keep gorillas and other wildlife healthy and their habitat secure. And this is Bwini Impenetrable Forest and the view from our office. We have three integrated programs, wildlife conservation with a focus on wildlife health, community health with a focus on one health and alternative livelihoods. When we found out that many people were unhealthy because they're poor and we started a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise. So this happens often, gorillas go to people's gardens, eat their banana plants. Of course, they're very unhappy. It causes a lot of human wildlife conflict and tension, and there's great potential for cross-species disease transmission because of open defecation, both by gorillas, obviously, because they're wild animals, and people. So we carry out regular comparative disease investigations between the people, the gorillas, and the livestock. And you know we regularly collect fecal samples from their night nests. We did that today as well. And we examine them for parasites, bacteria, and viruses, including COVID. And in this particular study, we looked at Jadia in the mountain gorillas, people, and livestock. And we found that over time, Jadia had really reduced in the gorillas to non-detectable levels when we did this study. Um, and then we attributed this to the improvement on community hygiene wherever they go out. However, there was a high incidence of Jadia in infants in the local hospital, Bindi Community Hospital. And so we were able to talk to the hospital and they educated the mothers to to collect water from protected water sources and to always boil the water before, the, before they mix up any formula for their babies or the, any food for their babies. And we talked to cattle keepers about, we trained cattle keepers to dig cattle water troughs so that they don't defecate in the same waters that the people and the gorillas are passing through. And so this was published in Frontiers for Public Health. Cryptosporidia was still present in some areas, in the gorillas as well. And we hired or recruited another village health team member to talk about improved community hygiene and sanitation. And so we regularly do such comparative disease investigations in our field laboratory at the Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center. We do a lot of behavior change communication. Started off with this brochure I developed while working as a fast vet for the Wildlife Authority. And this then led to the buildup of conservation through public health when people made gorillas sick and we started the NGO. A big focus of our NGO, uh, which we began in 2003, is to train community health workers. Uh, at the time, we called them community health and conservation workers. And now we call them village health and conservation teams because in Uganda, they're called VHTs. Women are able to stand up in their community and talk about the risks of human and gorilla disease transmission, the importance of having manageable family sizes. Right now, thankfully, people are not having babies every year, but these are some of what our volunteers do. And this has really helped to change behavior. We focus a lot on preventing infectious diseases, scabies, HIV, TB, um, and more recently, COVID-19. 
So they refer people to the health centers. They conduct good hygiene. They focus on good hygiene and sanitation, getting people to adopt hand washing stations and, re and have pit latrines. They promote voluntary family planning, nutrition, sustainable agriculture, and they report homes visited by gorillas so that the gorilla guardians can herd them back. The gorilla guardians are from the local community. They raise awareness on the risks of zoonotic disease and why we should protect the gorillas and the forest and ecotourism, how they can access revenue. Currently, they are we are reaching, we went up from 26 to now 200, over 270 volunteers who we're working with, and they're reaching 40,000 people in, in 7,000 households. We added family planning because people had too many children. That have, most people are having 10 children, and we carry out a lot of behavior change using shaming behavior tool methods. You know, this late, for example, this family has too many children. She's still expecting another one. Eventually they start poaching because they don't have enough food. Only half the children are able to go to school. The rest have to stay at home. Um, they have lots of diseases. They have teenage pregnancies. They have early deaths and there's lots of domestic violence. And then the second family, when the gorillas come out, they try and chase them back and they're scratched. And all of this is based on reality. And then the second family has only four children and they all go to school. And when the gorillas come out, they call the human gorilla conflict team to herd them back. Um, the boy becomes a ranger, the girl becomes a nurse. And which family would you rather be? So this is really changing behavior. We found that the most popular contraceptive was Depo-Provera. So we partnered with Family Health International to see the potential for lay community health workers to safely give injections. We started this in 2008 and it became a national policy in Uganda with the five pilot sites that FHI worked with. And it's now spread to the to Kenya through the Green Belt Movement um, using a, what you call a population health environment approach. We're sustaining them with group livelihood projects um, like goats and cows, and they've reinvested them into village saving and loan associations. We have had very few dropouts after 15 years, maybe 5% mainly due to growing old or, you know, one of them joined a church that went against family planning. And so they're continuing to administer the injections and now they're also administering Cyanapress, which is the updated version of Depo-Provera. And we're pleased to have contributed to the increase in mountain gorillas. There's an increase of women on family planning. We used to be below the national average. We're now above the national average. Women are more involved in conservation and men in family planning. Gorillas are better protected in community land. People don't kill them if they see them. They want to protect them because they're benefiting from them. And we've highlighted the benefits. There's a great increase in hand washing stations, seven times fold increase. We have reduced human related disease outbreaks in the gorillas and sports coibis and jadia. So all of this has contributed to the growth of the mountain gorilla population from when CTPH began in 2003. Um, I participated in the first gorilla census in 1997 when we counted 300 gorillas in Uganda and all the veterinary care, improved community engagement, improved community health, where as communities get healthier, gorillas are falling sick less often from human disease, improved tourism, benefits, and all of that has contributed to an increase. The governments and NGOs and private sector have all contributed to this increase. Like, when COVID came, oh, sorry, could, you, could you could you wrap up in the next minute, please? Sorry. Okay, I will. Um, we've con we continue to use the same models to prevent COVID by testing people and gorillas for COVID, and also carrying out a lot of education, working with the same structures that we've worked with, and we are now expanding to new parishes around Bwindi, advocating a lot for PHE advocacy, where we're working with both health and conservation partners to advocate for this one health approach, which when you add family planning becomes population health and environment. And we're pleased that this model is also being scaled up in other parts of Uganda, which Dr. Julius Lutwama is going to talk about in the collaborative one health research in epidemics, which we're working closely with Julius and Laura, Professor Laura, to do all of this. And for more information, uh, please visit our website and Thank you all for everything. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gladys. I'm so sorry to cut you short. Um, uh, there's so much that uh, you're doing that's 
fascinating to hear about and clearly having huge impact in in the communities which is wonderful to hear um but i do want to keep us time so that we can hear from our last speaker um who is Professor Julius Lutwama, who's the Deputy Director at the Uganda Virus Research Institute, UVRI. Um, and again, just a brief introductus, an introduction to Professor Lutwama. He did his PhD in entomology and also received further specialized training in molecular virology and entomology. Um, at UVRI, he also leads the Department of Arbovirology, Emerging and Reemerging Infectious Diseases. He leads the WHO Collaborating National Influenza Center and the Highly Infectious Diseases Diagnostic Laboratory. Um, so very busy man. We're very grateful to you for being here. Um, he's participated in numerous virus disease studies, outbreak investigations, response and control. And he's part of a lot of teams who've discovered new viruses in, in Uganda. He's also on many international task forces, committees, associations, and he's an honorary associate professor at the Makerere University College of Health Sciences. Um, so, Professor Lutwama, let me hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I don't know whether my presentation is... That it's perfect. Now. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much. This is just an overview of a small introduction. The, then talk about the inequalities uh, at the animal, uh, human animal interface in Uganda. Why and what is driving these inequalities? What is being done to address these inequalities? And a few experiences in addressing uh, these uh, inequalities. It is not a concern. Okay, uh, this has already been uh, 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 shown by uh, by uh, Doug, something similar to this. You can see Uganda uh, is an area which is a high biodiversity hotspot, an, an emergent zone uh, for infectious diseases. So we are always uh, having so many outbreaks. Uh, as you can see in the last couple of years, in the last two decades, we have had numerous outbreaks of viral hemorrhagic fevers. And all of these uh, are actually uh, zoonotic diseases coming from uh, animals. So we are having lots of outbreaks. And this uh, uh, here is leaving out some of the diseases like yellow fever, dengue, and others which has been left out. So what, what, what are these inequalities? What are the inequalities in uh, human, uh, animal, environmental health? Of course, they are the general inequalities in human, animal, uh, and environment, um, which are really due to perception of human health as being more important. So this brings about uh, those inequalities. So uh, human health gets a lot of funding, there are better capacities, personnel are better trained, and of course, the infrastructures for human health uh, are better or uh, are provided more for uh, because uh, because of that perception uh, of saying that human health is more important than all the other health, forgetting that human health uh, is affected by the environment and the animal health. Of course, there is also rural versus urban and peri-urban uh, areas where you find that uh, uh, in the rural areas, of course, there are lots of inequalities compared to the peri-urban and urban areas. Then turning to the human-animal interfaces, of course, we have uh, very few interfaces uh, of pets uh, in Uganda. There are very few people who actually have animals on, as pets. However, there are also some people who have got animals for protection, uh, those who have got cats and dogs, uh, who use them for protection. And of course, there is uh, domestic animals which provide life rules uh, for many people. Uh, my uh, major experiences are actually of the wild animal uh, interface uh, between the humans, uh, the livestock, and uh, and of course the wild animals. Well, turning to these, uh, the human domestic animal wildlife interface, most often, of course, this uh, is in the rural settings where there is a lot of poverty, they have reduced uh, employment capacities, the opportunities are also low, the lack of capacities for health. Some of these communities have got to, long, to walk very long distances to get uh, human health uh, 
um, um, our, con our consultancies. Uh, of course, the veterinary uh, uh, health is also uh, very far or reduced. And of course, um, uh, environmental health is more or less almost uh, non-existent in these uh, areas. So these are inequalities um, uh, at the interfaces and we need to have a way to, uh, to handle these. So what are the drivers of these uh, uh, risks and vulnerabilities? At the global level, of course, uh, Doug talked about these, these the global economic forces between the developing and the developed world, weak lead, of course, uh, uh, to uh, inequalities. At the national level, of course, the political priorities, the political priorities of decisions uh, also uh, bring about uh, lots of uh, inequalities because of the unequal distribution of income and uh, wealth leading to poverty and marginalization, especially for the rural poor. And like I said, the rural poor are the one where you have most of the human wildlife interfaces. At the local level, uh, where you have the human animal interface, the poor have uh, capacities, no work, poor infrastructure. There's a lot of increased human and animal population. When there's increased human population, of course, you find the encroach into the wildlife, they go into the forests. Uh, when there is uh, increased animal population, the popu uh, for example, if they're domestic animals, again, you'll find people moving into the parks to graze their animals. But if there is also an increase in the animals in the, the wildlife, then these animals, again, are also going to come and uh, uh, encroach, or they're going to come and raid plantations, or they're going to come and mix up uh, with areas where people are uh, 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 found. Of course, there is a lot of uh, environmental degradation, and this is also impeding very much uh, on uh, how the uh, human and animal interface react uh, differently. At the household level, the low incomes, poor housing, there's a lot of discrimination and lack of access to health uh, uh, services for these people where there is a lot of this uh, human animal interface. And uh, this is uh, where you have uh, wildlife. So uh, how have we addressed this inequality in One Health? Historically, Uganda impressed One Health quite a long time ago. Uh, the Ministry of Health instituted the Veterinary Public Health Division uh, in the 1980s. And uh, this, has, this was brought about uh, uh, to see that at least when, uh, uh, when uh, there are uh, cases uh, uh, of diseases from uh, uh, the humans or from the animals. At least these are handled together uh, at, uh, through the veterinary public health uh, a division at the Ministry of Health. Of course, the coordinating office uh, for control of trypanosomiasis was another example where you had both veterinary, human environment and wildlife working together to make sure that we reduce trypanosomiasis. And I think as we talk now, the reduction is so low that I think they're considering of uh, uh, having completely eradicated uh, trypanosomiasis in Uganda. Uh, in 2013, there was a One Health Memorandum of Understanding between the medical and veterinary professions, and now they are training more or less together. And of course, in 2016, uh, the Minister of Health, Minister of Agriculture, uh, Minister of Tourism, where Uganda Wildlife Authority is, and the Minister of uh, Water and Environment establish a One Health framework, uh, legalizing uh, the formal collaboration and providing guidelines for their operations. In 2016, the Uganda National One Health Platform was launched, and this has the One Health Technical Working Group and the Zoonotic Diseases Coordinating Offices, all making sure, trying to see that we work together. Of course, the many outbreaks that I just talked about have been handled jointly using their One Health approach. Despite all of that, however, we are still working in silos. And to a very big extent, uh, the sectors are still working uh, individually. So one of my own experiences, uh, I've been a member of the National Task Force, which has all of these sectors, and of course, including the, uh, the communities, uh, the human health teams for clinical work, and of course, the ecological teams, which have wildlife, veterinary, and environment, trying to define, to define the sources of this outbreak and see what can be done 
uh, to learn more about these diseases so that we can be more prepared in future for those diseases. Um, uh, now turning to the Cori project. This is a One Health Consortium. This is a project that I lead. And of course it has Ministry of Health, including UVRI. Uh, UVRI is from Ministry of Health. We have uh, Uganda Wildlife. We have uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industries and Fisheries. And we have uh, CTPH, which Gladys has just been talking about. We have Macquarie University, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and of course the One Health Consortium, the One Health uh, Coordinating Office, which I've just talked about uh, in the last slide. And of course, we have consultants from the University of South California and the University College of London. This is a collaborative One Health Research Initiative, and that is why we call it CORI. Uh, it is funded by the International Development Research Center of Canada. And the theme is we want to understand and address intersectoral drivers for epidemics uh, through the One Health uh, concept. Our overall objective is to improve understanding and control of some of the neglected uh, uh, diseases using enhanced surveillance system and a One Health approach at the human animal wildlife interface in the Kata corridor of Uganda. Well, uh, we have uh, a number of specific objectives, but I I'm looking at uh, only these because of time. Uh, we are taking uh, social cultural factors and we want to undertake a gender and inequalities uh, analysis. And this is uh, going on and a lot of information has been uh, 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 obtained. Our developing, uh, our outcome is actually developing interventions. So we are designing a One Health centered model for the control and prevention of these diseases in Uganda that can be adapted for zoonosis and, uh, 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 and global significance. So we are also developing a sustainable One Health disease surveillance and reporting system. So uh, uh, the model we have is working together. Or we have all the sectors, all the sectors in this consortium working together to see how they can work together. And if this model works out very well, to see how this model can be extended to other diseases. And also are developing a One Health Disease Surveillance System in the villages at the lowest level. And uh, we are having a participatory uh, surveillance using people that we have referred to as community uh, One Health volunteers. You know, we, we have been having uh, 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 animal health volunteers, we've been having uh, village health volunteers, but we are coming up with a model where we are using community One Health uh, volunteers in that th they do not only look at one uh, uh, sector, but they look at the, all the, whatever is happening in, uh, in the villages and reporting this. So we have developed, we are developing these models. We are testing them out to see how uh, this uh, is working out and we believe that uh, these, our interventions are going to be successful and pass them on. So while doing this work, of course, we have looked at the, uh, uh, how the interface, uh, how the interactions are. In the first picture there, of course, you see how an elephant was passing uh, through a compound, uh, uh, a household, a homestead. So th there's a lot of interaction. Of, um, that way, diseases can be passed on uh, to humans or from the humans to the animals. And the second picture there, we're seeing buffaloes. These buffaloes have come close to a school. And of course, when there is an increase of population of animals in the wild, then they come out. And uh, of course, this kind of interaction, you can imagine why, why wouldn't people in this area get brucellosis? So that uh, that would, and of course, uh, you can see in these uh, other pictures Ju how the human, Julius, sorry to, to interrupt. I ask you to wrap up in the next minute, so please. I am certainly wrapping up. This is my second last uh, last second last uh, slide. Of course, you see how uh, uh, work is being carried out uh, in the field. You have the National Park Wildlife. You have uh, livestock, and of course, here some people are taking samples from a buffalo. So, what more do we need to do? We need to to see that one health becomes integral 
uh, uh, multi-sectoral national action in the multi-sectoral national plan for health security. We need implementation of the national one health policy. We have already policy, but it's not being implemented. We need training of new generation of global health scientists with capacities to collaborate and work together, not in silos. We need to strengthen efforts to bring the latest involved disciplines on board. We want to advocate all stakeholders, including communities for One Health, to understand and be able to do this uh, kind of, to be able to implement. We need that One Health approaches should be built into project designs at the onset and not just bringing them or thinking about them later on. We need interdisciplinary research and innovation to inform appropriate policies and practices that dis de decrease vulnerabilities of communities and the ecosystem. And of course, we need for governments to support, including funding, improved coordination and collaboration across sectors. And I acknowledge those people. And thank you very much for inviting me to give uh, this, uh, to be part of this panel. Thank you very much. Julius, thank you so much. Um, again, that was wonderful and a great insight into the breadth of some of the work uh, that you've been doing, but also that's been happening at the national and, and the global level as well. So really appreciate that insight. So I'm gonna open up for um, Q&A now. Um, I know we don't have very much time left. Uh, I, I would like to start um, with, one general question and just to ask people um, to to be relatively short in the responses because there are a couple of other questions I'd like to get to. Um, but one thing that, that's coming out across the presentations is the complexity of the power dynamics in One Health. Um, and this is partly because there's huge money involved. So whether it's massive agriculture, deforestation or, or tourism, to, to name just a few. And, and One Health often isn't in the short-term economic interest. So how do you think about tackling um, the disproportionate power of commercial entities, both legal and illegal uh, in, in the context of One Health? Um, and I'll open that up. Doug, I know, I know that you will want to say something about that. So um, if I can start with you and just give you a minute or so to respond to that. Yeah, um, I mean, this. I, I'd love to hear my my colleagues in in Uganda right, talk to this question as well because I I think this is probably the the dominant the dominant challenge here is and it goes to this question of 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 the 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 power inequity, um, sorry, on the ground uh, where you've got the weakness of the state essentially. Um, and then the, 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 the and the power of the, and the, the strong power of the of the commercial interests in these areas. It goes back to the sort of the peculiar geography of of this of this challenge. So then the answer then is how to um, increase the power of state actors in collaboration with um, civil society and other institutions, non state actors who are in a sense pro public goods or pro common goods. Um, in relation to managing health risks with sentinel surveillance um, going on in the communities um, through some kind of legislative framework and informed by um, an improved information network. And, you know, I think some of these techniques that are coming up from Southeast Asia, and I think there's modifications in, in Uganda already, um, these, these are participatory one, one Health disease detection systems uh, where you've got on the ground rapid syndromic diagnostics and, and use of cell phones and so on in community information networks um, is probably the answer. But there's got to be a legal framework around which this can operate, um, which can challenge um, and be, in, in a sense, oppositional to some of the, the blanketing effects which commercial forces will happen. And also give alternative livelihoods to those who are engaged in 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 um, in economic activities which which are detrimental to the One Health agenda, they, they can't. There's got to be some kind of balance between punitive action um, and incentives to transition across to a 
a formalized um, livelihood support. Um, so there's engagement in the communities and finding these alternative livelihoods is, is all part of the package as well. And, and I, um, so there are good models emerging. And I think obviously the experience from Uganda I'll be very interested in listening to. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll pass over then to Julius, uh, who uh, you have your hand up, so please. Yeah. Yes, uh, these uh, economic activities are actually a very big problem in Uganda. And uh, because Uganda is looking for investments, you find uh, that uh, when uh, people come in with money, uh, they, uh, they, they come in with a pretext that uh, they're going to provide employment, they're going to uh, bring a lot of uh, funding to the country. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, when they are coming, uh, while the uh, the National Environment Protection Agency is uh, uh, used to do some kind of evaluation, the the evaluation that is done normally does not consider other other sectors. It would be uh, very good uh, to have uh, the National Environment Protection Agency also working with human health and veterinary health and wildlife to see that uh, when these uh, 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 new um, uh, uh, investments are coming in, uh, at least they're not going to disrupt uh, the others, not only considering just the environment, because uh, we know very well that uh, uh, some forests in Uganda have been given out for sugar plantation, because we know the oil industry has disrupted the wildlife. Uh, we know um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, wetlands are being uh, are filled up uh, just to produce, uh, to put up industries. But all of this need to, at least when doing the environmental impact evaluation, it shouldn't stop at just the environmental impact uh, evaluation, but also include human animal uh, uh, effects. What are the effects that are going to happen to the humans and to the animals and not only the environment? That, that, that would be my suggestion, thank you. Thank you both um, very much. Again, it's a hugely complex topic that I don't think we can answer in, in five minutes, but really, really helpful to get those, those insights. Um, we are running out of time. I, I wanted to lift up one other question from the Q&A. Paula davis Olwell has asked, well, commented really on um, the lack of attention to expertise in social sciences and political sciences in, in One Health approaches. Um, and that even when uh, work is is nominally interdisciplinary, that often those those perspectives are still are still left out. Um, and I wondered if uh, one person might want to just take on an, uh, a quick response to that. Any any opinions on where social and political science currently fit within One Health? Uh, maybe I can uh, I could briefly answer that. We've worked with. Um... Oxford University and other groups to with social scientists from other disciplines to try and look at various ways that community members are changing as a result of whether One Health approaches are working. And so we got some funding from Darwin Initiative to see whether health investments have resulted in outcomes for conservation and sustainable development. And it came up with very interesting results, but we worked with social scientists in that particular evaluation. Um, there is a big role for social scientists in One Health. Uh, some of our team members are social scientists, and actually the Cori project that we're all doing together has a big social science component. So yes, we are working with social scientists. Uh, as far as political scientists go, um, maybe I'll let my other panelists answer that question. But it is very important to engage people at all levels, from community all the way up to the major decision makers in parliament, because that's where a lot of these policies uh, set and implemented and make a big difference for local communities um, where a lot of One Health interactions are most needed. Thank you, Gladys. Um, and thank you so much for um, highlighting the importance of, of the social science perspective and I think also the political science. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm afraid we're going to have to close. I'm so sorry to end the discussion because I think we could keep going for another hour. 
Um, but thank you so much to all of our panelists. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to share with us your experience and your insights into One Health and particularly its values for addressing inequalities. And I hope this is the start of, of more discussions to come as we move the work forward. Um, and just to, to highlight that our next event, which I think Caitlin is trying to share her screen, um, there we go, is um, on November 6th, it's at 9 a.m. Pacific time, um, and it is an intimate conversation with Anand Grover, looking at how can we achieve the highest attainable standard of health, even in the face of democratic recession. So I urge you all to join us for another interesting discussion again, and thank you for being with us today.